Chapter 11 of Thuvia, Made of Mars. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Merrill. Thuvia, Made of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 11 green men and white apes. A Torcasian sword smote a glancing blow across the forehead of Carthoris. He had a fleeting vision of soft arms about his neck and warm lips close to his before he lost consciousness. How long he lay there senseless he could not guess, but when he opened his eyes again he was alone, except for the bodies of the dead green men and Dusarians and the carcass of a great banth that lay half across his own. Thuvia was gone, nor was the body of Kar Komak among the dead. Weak from loss of blood, Carthoris made his way slowly toward Anthor, reaching its outskirts at dark. He wanted water more than any other thing, and so he kept on up a broad avenue toward the great central plaza, where he knew the precious fluid was to be found in a half-ruined building opposite the great palace of the ancient Jeddak, who once had ruled this mighty city. Disheartened and discouraged by the strange sequence of events that seemed foreordained to thwart his every attempt to serve the Princess of Parth, he paid little or no attention to his surroundings, moving through the deserted city as though no great white apes lurked in the black shadows of the mystery-haunted piles that flanked the broad avenues of the great plaza. But if Carthoris was careless of his surroundings, not so other eyes that watched his entrance into the plaza and followed his slow footsteps toward the marble pile that housed the tiny, half-choked spring whose water one might gain only by scratching a deep hole in the red sand that covered it. And as the Heliumite entered the small building, a dozen mighty, grotesque figures emerged from the doorway of the palace to speed noiselessly across the plaza toward him. For half an hour Carthoris remained in the building, digging for water and gaining the few much-needed drops which were the fruits of his labor. Then he rose and slowly left the structure. Scarce had he stepped beyond the threshold than twelve Torcasian warriors leaped upon him. No time, then, to draw longsword, but swift from his harness flew his long, slim dagger, and as he went down beneath them, more than a single green heart ceased beating at the bite of that keen point. Then they overpowered him and took his weapons away, but only nine of the twelve warriors who had crossed the plaza returned with their prize. They dragged their prisoner roughly to the palace pits, where in utter darkness they chained him with rusty links to the solid masonry of the wall. "'Tomorrow Thar Ban will speak with you,' they said. "'Now he sleeps, but great will be his pleasure when he learns who has wandered amongst us. And great will be the pleasure of Hortan Gur when Thar Ban drags him the mad fool who dared prick the great Jeddak with his sword.' Then they left him to the silence and the darkness. For what seemed hours Carthoris squatted upon the stone floor of his prison, his back against the wall in which was sunk the heavy eye-bolt that secured the chain which held him. Then, from out of the mysterious blackness before him, there came to his ears the sound of naked feet moving stealthily upon the stone, approaching nearer and nearer to where he lay unarmed and defenseless. Minutes passed, minutes that seemed hours, during which time periods of sepulchral silence would be followed by a repetition of the uncanny scraping of naked feet slinking warily upon him. At last he heard a sudden rush of unshod souls across the empty blackness, and at a little distance a scuffling sound, heavy breathing, and once what he thought the muttered imprecation of a man battling against great odds, then the clanging of a chain, and a noise as of the snapping back against the stone of a broken link. Again came silence, 
but for a moment only. Now he heard once more the soft feet approaching him. He thought that he discerned wicked eyes gleaming fearfully at him through the darkness. He knew that he could hear the heavy breathing of powerful lungs. Then came the rush of many feet toward him, and the things were upon him. Hands terminating in man-like fingers clutched at his throat and arms and legs. Hairy bodies strained and struggled against his own smooth hide as he battled in grim silence against these horrid foemen in the darkness of the pits of ancient Anthor. Thewed like some giant god was Carthoris of Helium, yet in the clutches of these unseen creatures of the pit's Stygian night he was helpless as a frail woman. Yet he battled on, striking futile blows against great hispid breasts he could not see, feeling thick squat throats beneath his fingers, the drool of saliva upon his cheek, and hot, foul breath in his nostrils. Fangs, too, mighty fangs, he knew, were close, and why they did not sink into his flesh he could not guess. At last he became aware of the mighty surging of a number of his antagonists, back and forth upon the great chain that held him, and presently came the same sound that he had heard at a little distance from him a short time before he had been attacked. His chain had parted, and the broken end snapped back against the stone wall. Now he was seized upon either side, and dragged at a rapid pace through the dark corridors, toward what fate he could not even guess. At first he had thought his foes might be of the tribe of Torcas, but their hairy bodies belied that belief. Now he was at last quite sure of their identity, though why they had not killed him and devoured him at once he could not imagine. After half an hour or more of rapid racing through the underground passages that are a distinguishing feature of all Barsoomian cities, modern as well as ancient, his captors suddenly emerged into the moonlight of a courtyard far from the central plaza. Immediately Carthoris saw that he was in the power of a tribe of the great white apes of Barsoom. All that had caused him doubt before as to the identity of his attackers was the hairiness of their breasts, for the white apes are entirely hairless, except for a great shock bristling from their heads. Now he saw the cause of that which had deceived him. Across the chests of each of them were strips of hairy hide usually of Banth, in imitation of the harness of the green warriors who so often camped at their deserted city. Carthoris had read of the existence of tribes of apes that seemed to be progressing slowly toward higher standards of intelligence. Into the hands of such, he realized, he had fallen. But what were their intentions toward him? As he glanced about the courtyard, he saw fully fifty of the hideous beasts, squatting on their haunches, and at a little distance from him another human being, closely guarded. As his eyes met those of his fellow captive, a smile at the other's face, and Kaor, red man, burst from his lips. It was Kar Komak, the bowman. Kaor, cried Carthoris in response. How came you here, and what befell the princess? Red men, like yourself, descended in mighty ships that sailed the air even as the great ships of my distant day sailed the five seas," replied Karkomak. They fought with the green men of Torcas. They slew Komal, god of Lothar. I thought they were your friends, and I was glad when finally those of them who had survived the battle carried the red girl to one of the ships and sailed away with her into the safety of the high air. Then the green men seized me and carried me to a great empty city where they chained me to a wall in a black pit. Afterward came these and dragged me hither. And what of you, red man? Carthoris related all that had befallen him, and as the two men talked, the great apes squatted about them, watching them intently. What are we to do now? asked the bowman. Our case looks rather hopeless, replied Carthoris ruefully. These creatures are born man-eaters. Why they have not already devoured us, I cannot imagine. There, he whispered, see, the end is coming. Kar Komak looked in the direction Carthoris indicated to see a huge ape advancing with a mighty bludgeon. 
It is thus they like best to kill their prey, said Carthoris. Must we die without a struggle? asked Carcomac. Not I, replied Carthoris, though I know how futile our best defense must be against these mighty brutes. Oh, for a long sword! Or a good bow, added Carcomac, and a uton of bowmen. At the words, Carthoris half sprang to his feet, only to be dragged roughly down by his guard. Carcomac, he cried, why cannot you do what Tario and Jav did? They had no bowmen other than those of their own creation. You must know the secret of their power. Call forth your own Uton, Carcomac. The Lotharian looked at Carthoris in wide-eyed astonishment as the full purport of the suggestion bore in upon his understanding. Why not? he murmured. The savage ape bearing the mighty bludgeon was slinking toward Carthoris. The Heliumite's fingers were working as he kept his eyes upon his executioner. Carcomac bent his gaze penetratingly upon the apes. The effort of his mind was evidenced by the sweat upon his contracted brows. The creature that was to slay the red man was almost within arm's reach of his prey, when Carthoris heard a hoarse shout from the opposite side of the courtyard. In common with the squatting apes and the demon with the club, he turned in the direction of the sound to see a company of sturdy bowmen rushing from the doorway of a nearby building. With screams of rage, the apes leaped to their feet to meet the charge. A volley of arrows met them halfway, sending a dozen rolling lifeless to the ground. Then the apes closed with their adversaries. All their attention was occupied by the attackers. Even the guard had deserted the prisoners to join the battle. Come, whispered Carcomac. Now may we escape while their attention is diverted from us by my bowmen. And leave those brave fellows leaderless? cried Carthoris, whose loyal nature revolted at the merest suggestion of such a thing. Carcomac laughed. You forget, he said, that they are but thin air, figments of my brain. They will vanish, unscathed, when we have no further need for them. Praised be your first ancestor, red man, that you thought of this chance in time. It would never have occurred to me to imagine that I might wield the same power that brought me into existence. You are right, said Carthoris. Still, I hate to leave them, though there is naught else to do. And so the two turned from the courtyard, and making their way into one of the broad avenues, crept stealthily in the shadows of the building toward the great central plaza upon which were the buildings occupied by the green warriors when they visited the deserted city. When they had come to the plaza's edge, Carthoris halted. "'Wait here,' he whispered. "'I go to fetch Thotes, since on foot we may never hope to escape the clutches of these green fiends.' To reach the courtyard where the thoats were kept, it was necessary for Carthoris to pass through one of the buildings which surrounded the square. Which were occupied and which were not, he could not even guess, so he was compelled to take considerable chances to gain the enclosure in which he could hear the restless beasts squealing and quarreling amongst themselves. Chance carried him through a dark doorway into a large chamber, in which lay a score or more green warriors, wrapped in their sleeping silks and furs. Scarce had Carthoris passed through the short hallway that connected the door of the building and the great room beyond it, than he became aware of the presence of something or someone in the hallway through which he had but just passed. He heard a man yawn, and then, behind him, he saw the figure of a sentry rise from where the fellow had been dozing, and stretching himself, resume his wakeful watchfulness. Carthoris realized that he must have passed within a foot of the warrior, doubtless rousing him from his slumber. To retreat now would be impossible. Yet to cross through that room of sleeping warriors seemed almost equally beyond the pale of possibility. Carthoris shrugged his broad shoulders and chose the lesser evil. Warily he entered the room. At his right, against the wall, leaned several swords and rifles and spears, extra weapons which the warriors had stacked here, ready to their hands should there be a night alarm calling them suddenly from slumber. Beside each sleeper lay his weapon. These were never far from their owners, from childhood to death. 
The sight of the swords made the young man's palm itch. He stepped quickly to them, selecting two short swords, one for Karkomak, the other for himself, also some trappings for his naked comrade. Then he started directly across the center of the apartment among the sleeping Torkasians. Not a man of them moved until Carthoris had completed more than half of the short, though dangerous, journey. Then a fellow directly in his path turned restlessly upon his sleeping silks and furs. The Heliumite paused above him, one of the short swords in readiness should the warrior waken. For what seemed an eternity to the young prince, the green man continued to move uneasily upon his couch. Then, as though actuated by springs, he leaped to his feet and faced the red man. Instantly Carthoris struck, but not before a savage grunt escaped the other's lips. In an instant the room was in turmoil. Warriors leaped to their feet, grasping their weapons as they rose, and shouting to one another for an explanation of the disturbance. To Carthoris, all within the room was plainly visible in the dim light reflected from without, for the further moon stood directly at zenith. But to the eyes of the newly awakened green men, objects as yet had not taken on familiar forms. They but saw vaguely the figures of warriors moving about their apartment. Now one stumbled against the corpse of him whom Carthoris had slain. The fellow stooped, and his hand came in contact with the cleft skull. He saw about him the giant figures of other green men, and so he jumped to the only conclusion that was open to him. The thirds! he cried. The thirds are upon us! Rise, warriors of Torcas, and drive home your swords within the hearts of Torcas's ancient enemies! Instantly the green men began to fall upon one another with naked swords. Their savage lust of battle was aroused. To fight, to kill, to die with cold steel buried in their vitals. Ah, that to them was Nirvana. Carthoris was quick to guess their error and take advantage of it. He knew that in the pleasure of killing they might fight on long after they had discovered their mistake unless their attention was distracted by sight of the real cause of the altercation. And so he lost no time in continuing across the room to the doorway upon the opposite side, which opened into the inner court, where the savage thoats were squealing and fighting among themselves. Once here he had no easy task before him. To catch and mount one of these habitually rageful and intractable beasts was no child's play under the best of conditions. But now, when silence and time were such important considerations, it might well have seemed quite hopeless to a less resourceful and optimistic man than the son of the great warlord. From his father he had learned much concerning the traits of these mighty beasts, and from Tars Tarkas, also, when he had visited that great green jeddak among his horde at Thark. So now he centered upon the work in hand all that he had ever learned about them from others and from his own experience for he, too, had ridden and handled them many times. The temper of the Thoats of Torcas appeared even shorter than their vicious cousins among the Tharks and Warhoons, and for a time it seemed unlikely that he should escape a savage charge on the part of a couple of old bulls that circled, squealing, about him. But at last he managed to get close enough to one of them to touch the beast, with the feel of his hand upon the sleek hide, the creature quieted, and in answer to the telepathic command of the red man, sank to its knees. In a moment Carthoris was upon its back, guiding it toward the great gate that leads from the courtyard through a large building at one end into an avenue beyond. The other bull, still squealing and enraged, followed after his fellow. There was no bridle upon either for these strange creatures are controlled entirely by suggestion, when they are controlled at all. Even in the hands of the giant green men, bridal reins would be hopelessly futile against the mad savagery and mastodonic strength of the thoat, and so they are guided by that strange telepathic power with which the men of Mars have learned to communicate in a crude way with the lower orders of their planet. With difficulty, Carthoris urged the two beasts to the gate, where, leaning down, he raised the latch. 
Then the thoat he was riding placed his great shoulder to the skeel wood planking, pushed through, and a moment later the man and the two beasts were swinging silently down the avenue to the edge of the plaza, where Car Comac hid. Here Carthoris found considerable difficulty in subduing the second thoat, and as Car Comac had never before ridden one of the beasts, it seemed a most hopeless job. But at last the bowman managed to scramble to the sleek back, and again the two beasts fled softly down the moss-grown avenues toward the open sea-bottom beyond the city. All that night and the following day, and the second night, they rode toward the northeast. No indication of pursuit developed, and at dawn of the second day Carthoris saw in the distance the waving ribbon of great trees that marked one of the long Barsumian waterways. Immediately they abandoned their thoats and approached the cultivated district on foot. Carthoris also discarded the metal from his harness, or such of it as might serve to identify him as a Heliumite, or of royal blood, for he did not know to which nation belonged this waterway, and upon Mars it is always well to assume every man and nation your enemy until you have learned the contrary. It was mid-forenoon when the two at last entered one of the roads that cut through the cultivated districts at regular intervals, joining the arid wastes on either side with the great, white, central highway that follows through the center from end to end of the far-reaching, thread-like farmlands. The high wall surrounding the fields served as a protection against surprise by raiding green hordes as well as keeping the savage banths and other carnivora from the domestic animals and the human beings upon the farms. Carthoris stopped before the first gate he came to, pounding for admission. The young man who answered his summons greeted the two hospitably, though he looked with considerable wonder upon the white skin and auburn hair of the bowman. After he had listened for a moment to a partial narration of their escape from the Torquasians, he invited them within, took them to his house, and bade the servants there prepare food for them. As they waited in the low-sealed, pleasant living room of the farmhouse until the meal should be ready, Carthoris drew his host into conversation that he might learn his nationality, and thus the nation under whose dominion lay the waterway where circumstance had placed him. "'I am Hal Vass,' said the young man, "'son of Vass Cor of Dusar." a noble in the retinue of Astok, prince of Dusar. At present I am Duar of the road for this district. Carthoris was very glad that he had not disclosed his identity, for though he had no idea of anything that had transpired since he left Helium, or that Astok was at the bottom of all his misfortunes, he well knew that the Dusarian had no love for him, and that he could hope for no assistance within the dominions of Dusar. And who are you? asked Hal Vass. By your appearance I take you for a fighting man, but I see no insignia upon your harness. Can it be that you are a panthen? Now these wandering soldiers of fortune are common upon Barsoom, where most men love to fight. They sell their services wherever war exists, and in the occasional brief intervals when there is no organized warfare between the Red Nations, they join one of the numerous expeditions that are constantly being dispatched against the green men in protection of the waterways that traverse the wilder portions of the globe. When their service is over, they discard the metal of the nation they have been serving until they shall have found the new master. In the intervals they wear no insignia, their war-torn harness and grim weapons being sufficient to attest their calling. The suggestion was a happy one, and Carthoris embraced the chance it afforded to account satisfactorily for himself. There was, however, a single drawback. In times of war such panthens as happened to be within the domain of a belligerent nation were compelled to don the insignia of that nation and fight with her warriors. As far as Carthoris knew, Dusar was not at war with any other nation. But there was never any telling when one red nation would be flying at the throat of a neighbor, even though the great and powerful alliance, at the head of which was his father, John Carter, had managed to maintain a long peace upon the greater portion of Barsoom. 
A pleasant smile lighted Hal Vass's face as Carthoris admitted his vocation. "'It is well,' exclaimed the young man, "'that you chanced to come hither, for here you will find the means of obtaining service in short order. My father, Vass Kor, is even now with me, having come hither to recruit a force for the new war against Helium.'" End of chapter 11